Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Well, I'm glad it's here, everybody here that you didn't let the rain keeping you from coming to church. It's a good. So, so we're going to continue in this two-part series uh, that we talked about, Samson. Um, and today's title is called The Restoration of a Fallen Hero. Now, Samson, of course, most of you know, was this mighty judge, right? This judge that was so strong, like an incredible Hulk, I guess you can think about it. But Samson came into this world as a promise from God that he was going to be this Nazareth. He was going to be set apart for the glory of God. Right? He was going to be the liver for the nation of Israel. And when you read the book of Judges chapter 13, there's no doubt that God used him in this way. Right? God used him this way. But because of his sins, right, it hampered his usefulness. And these sins ruined his life. Now, Samson was characterized as a man by his weakness in the flesh, his weakness in wicked women, right? His desire to elicit sexual relationships that also hindered his service to the Lord. That eventually it cost him his, it cost him his freedom, right? It cost him his ministry. It cost him his life. Two weeks ago, I talked to you about how Samson was deceived by this ungodly woman, a woman that he loved. Her name was Delilah, right? And Delilah tricked Samson to revealing where his strength came from. Now, Samson's strength was not of his own. It came from the Lord, right? It came from the Lord. Now, this, Samson's powers was related to his Nazareth vows, and his hair was a symbol of that vow. So, when he allowed Delilah to cut his hair, well, Samson showed his contempt for, the, for his vows to the Lord. As a result, the God removed his hand from Samson's life and allowed him to be captured by his enemies. And the Philistines, they, they bound him, they, they took out his eyes, and they put him in prison. They made this boy grind, right? This mighty judge of Israel was reduced just to do the work of a slave woman. Thankfully, the story of Samson doesn't end here. Right, let's be thankful for that. These verses we're about to read records the restoration of a fallen hero. These verses here reminds us that no matter how far you fall, that when you are saved, you belong to God. And God has a plan to get you back. And that should be encouraging news for us Christians, right? Because we all fail. We all fail. And like Samson, sometimes we fall in a big way. We all fall, we all fail the Lord time to time, don't we? When you read the Bible, you see all these heroes, all these people that have this great faith. Like you see their lives. And in Hebrews chapter 11, they, they, talk, they call it the hall of the faithful. But you can really think about it, you can change that to the hall of failures. Because all these people have failed the Lord in a big way. I mean, Abraham, Abraham, he, he lacked the faith to believe that God was going to protect him when he went to Egypt. So he lied about his wife. Sarah, she laughed at God. She mocked his promises. Isaac also lied about his wife. Right? Moses committed murder and tried to cover it up. And Rahab was a prostitute. See, a successful Christian is not a person that never fails, but is a person when he fails, he knows what to do, and he seeks the Lord. Amen. Right? A successful Christian accepts God's remedy for sin, right? And he reaches up to God to be cleansed and to be forgiven when he fails. And this is what these scriptures that we're going to read is about. So let's see what God wants to teach us today, this morning, when it comes to the restoration of the fallen hero. So the first point I want to make, it was a time of restoration. It was a time of restoration. I'm going to read Judges chapter 16. And I lost my place. Judges chapter 16, verse 22. Just give me one second. Here, here we go. What do we call this, Hank? String leader. String Yes, you go. I didn't use it correctly. So Judges chapter 16, verse 22, it says, But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. 
Okay, so point A is the power in the restoration, okay? The power in the restoration. His hair began to grow back. After time, Samson began to grow back, right? Listen, if you remember, his hair was a symbol of his vow to the Lord as a Nazareth, right? Samson's strength did not come from his hair. It came from his relationship with God, right? And regrowth of his hair was symbolic of the restoration of the special relationship that he enjoyed with God. Okay? Point B. The picture in the restoration. Okay? The regrowth of his hair is the picture of the truth that God is not done with Samson yet. Amen. Right? God's grace allows Samson to live long enough for his hair to grow back. And also to tell us that God has a plan for Samson. Point C, the problem. The problem in the restoration. Samson's hair grew back, but it was going to be a slow process, right? The average hair grows about one-eighth of an inch per week. Translates about six inches a year, right? So for hair to grow to his waist, it's going to take about six years. So all this is saying that Samson's process of restoration was going to be a long, long time, right? I mean, he wasn't going to return back to his service overnight. Now, there are a few observations we need to notice about the process of restoration. All right, here's one. If you have sinned and failed the Lord, especially in a severe and public way, restoration is possible, but it will be gradual. Okay? You can't expect to be returned back to service overnight. Also, you can be forgiven of your sins instant, but restoration might take a while. It might take a long time. Right? It takes time to earn the trust back from others. See, sin takes a tremendous toll on people. So it takes time for the pain, the distrust, the effects of sin to ease. Okay? Also, failures in your life is not because of a sudden fall to sin. No, it's accumulation of a long period of times of disobedience. Nobody wakes up decides to be a murderer. Nobody wakes up decides to commit adultery. It is long periods of time of being disobedient to God, crossing that line of temptation over and over until you get to that line of murder and adultery, right? It's why it takes time to replace good, bad habits with good habits. That's why it's going to take time to change the way your mind thinks. That's, it's going to take time for the way you change the way you live your life. Also, while sin might be forgiven and the sinner might be made right with God, forgiveness does not cancel out the consequences of sin. I mean, Samson's hair grew back but he's still in jail, he's still bounded, he's still blind, and he's still grinding grain. See, sin leaves a terrible mark on the life of the sinner. The scars of sin can be physical, they can be emotional, they can be mental, and they can be spiritual. And these scars that are left behind because of sin, they may not ever fully be healed, right? So while your relationship with God and with others might be restored, the reminders of your sin may haunt you for the rest of your life. Regret, guilt, or a loss of peace may stalk you until you leave this world. That's why we need to remember as Christians, when we sin, it always brings consequences. And those consequences may follow you to the grave. And we may be forced to live our lives asking us these two simple questions. What was I thinking? Why did I do that? I bet you there's people in prison that have given their life to Christ. And they look back at their life and say, what was I thinking? Why did I do that? Or there could be people that didn't go to jail and they did some horrific things. And they're asking themselves those two simple questions. Now, while there is restoration for Samson, right, the service for Samson was limited, okay? Is it possible to commit a sin that's going to disqualify you from holding a certain position in the church? It's not because you can't be forgiven. It's not because God can't forgive you. The issue is people, right? That's the problem. 
People won't follow a leader they have no confidence in. So these verses challenge us to avoid sin at all costs. Take the necessary steps that you need to take to avoid sin. Right? God's going to help you be the people he saved you to be. God's going to be there in the hour of temptation. God's going to protect your testimony and your reputation for his glory. But also so you can remain useful for him. These verses remind us that there's restoration for the fallen. And guess who's the fallen? Everybody that's born into this world. Okay? I love what uh, 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 says. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, I like this, all, right? Not some, not one page, but all unrighteousness. That's all you got to do. You just got to confess your sins. Do what you did wrong. And what does He do? He takes care of it all for you. Amen to God, right? All right. So the next one, it, is a, it was a time of reproach. It was a time of reproach. Now, this word reproach, because uh, when I used to study the Bible, I'd ask, what does reproach mean? So let me tell you real quick. Reproach is an expression of rebuke or disapproval, okay? So let me read chapter, I mean, verses 23 and 25. All right. So 23 and 25 says, Now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, Our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, Call Samson when, that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison and he entertained them and they made him stand between the pillars. Alright so the point A is God's man was degraded right he was degraded Samson was brought into this temple the temple of Dagon now Dagon was the god of the Philistines and he was portrayed as half fish and half man so below the waist he was half fish above the waist he was half man and they worshipped this god because they were fishermen so they wanted Dagon to bless their efforts to catch more fish. So verse 25 says, so they brought in Samson in for prison because they wanted him to entertain the Philistines, right? They brought in Samson so they could mock him. They were drunk. They wanted to have a good time. And they said, let's make Samson do some performance like some type of circus freak. Understand, they're no longer f afraid of Samson, right? This mighty, unbeatable judge of Israel. They no longer see Samson as a threat to their way of life. They see Samson as an object of mockery. They brought this, this judge in so they can laugh at him. In their eyes, they see Samson as this been diminished to nothing. Let's just bring him out of here so we can have a good time and laugh at this guy. See, Samson was humiliated. I'm pretty sure he felt worthless. I'm pretty sure he felt like a loser. I know I would have. Right? But when he was in his sins, he couldn't see the danger that looked by. Right? But now, oh, he sees it clearly. Right? But it's too late. Right? Sin has humiliated this once proud judge. Because of this sin, it turned the mighty, fearsome warrior into a clown. Because of his sins, he's been transformed from the stuff of legends to the stuff of a punchline for the enemy of God. And this is what sin will do in our lives as well. If we allow sin to reign in our hearts, right? Sin has a power to lower you down where people can point at you and whisper behind your back your failures. Sin has a power to destroy you, to degrade you, to de diminish you, if you allow sin to reign in your heart. All right, point B is God's glory was diminished. Okay, so point A was Samson was degraded. Point B, God's glory was diminished. Now it was diminished because Samson was defeated. 
And the, Phil the Philistines, they worshiped their god Dagon. They gave him credit for this victory. They said it was because of him they defeated their enemy. Because Samson probably thought, probably believed, I'll just have fun. I'll go do what I want to do, be my sin, right? And I'll eventually go back to serving the Lord and going back and helping the people. He never imagined that he would be captured. He never imagined that he would be humiliated. He never believed that his sins will allow his enemies to mock God. Doesn't that sound like us sometimes? Yeah. Right? But Samson learned something the hard way. Two things he learned. One, that sin always brings consequences to the life of the sinner. Right? And second, when God's people sin, it always reflects bad on the Lord. We must remember as Christians, whatever we do, it's either going to bring glory to God or it's going to dishonor God. See, when David sinned with Bathsheba, when he slept with that married woman, right? He was confronted by Nathan, the prophet. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14, Nathan said this, Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord. That's some harsh words, huh? Utterly scorn. Have you ever done anything in your life that utterly scorned the Lord? Maybe you can think of one. Maybe more than one. And if you think you haven't done any, it's because you're blind. We all have done something that scorned the Lord. We must remember that we have salvation. So I don't want you to get confused. We have salvation in the Lord. We belong to Him. But we must do nothing in our lives that's going to bring disgrace or dishonor or allow our enemies to mock our God. So let's look at some things that God wants us to do. To Titus chapter 2, verse 3 through 5, it says this. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. And say they should teach others what is good. These older women, women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children. To live wisely and be pure. To work in their homes. To do good and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. Now listen, guys, before you start looking at your wife and say, hey, man, we're talking about you here, right? No. I know it's for ladies, but guys, this is some good stuff for us too. We should always live in a way to honor God, right? We should not slander others. We shouldn't be drinkers, right? We should teach others to do good. We should love our children. We should live wisely, to live pure, to do good. And we should bring no shame to God. So it's to us too, guys. Romans chapter 2, verse 22 through 24 says this. You say it's wrong to commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? You condemn idolatry, but do you use items stolen from pagan temples? You're so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God breaking it. No wonder the scripture says the Gentiles, and by the way, that's everybody that's not a Jew, that's us. Blasphemy the name of God because of you. Let's don't be hypocrites, right? We, as Christians, we know, right, that our lives should speak the name of Jesus. When we walk, if somebody walks in your house, they should say, oh, this person loves Jesus. This is a, a godly home. If people at work should see you, this is the guy, you, you need help, he'll pray for you. They should know that about you. Your family should know that you're a godly man. You should not be that person they say, oh, he's a hypocrite. Let's hear other things that God desires for us. 1 Peter 1.16 says, For the scripture says, You must be holy because I am holy. Philippians 1 verse 27 says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven. I mean, that's some good news there, guys. I don't know about you, but, you know, citizens, right? When you give your life to Jesus, you become a citizen in heaven. Right? So that means we're here on earth on vacation. Right? This home, this is not our home. Our home is with Him. And we're citizens of that. Now your decision is if you want to have a good vacation or a bad vacation while you're down here. Right? Conducting yourself in a manner of worthy of the good news about Christ. 
then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you're standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 through 16 says this, Friends, you always follow my instructions when I was with you, and now that I'm away is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you, giving you the desires and the powers to do what pleases Him. Do everything without complaining and arguing so no one can criticize you. I like that part. Don't do anything complaining. And It's like when kids, you tell the kids to clean your room and they're cleaning it, right? And they're just, eh, 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 stupid dad, don't make me do this stuff, right? It's like when, when we tell you you got to tie, you're like, mm, I'm going to get this tie this money, right? Well, don't do it complaining. Do it because you love Jesus. We want our kids to clean their room because they, they want to help us, right? In the same way, we want to serve the Lord because we love Jesus. Live clean. Innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people, hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain, that my work was not useless. So again, what does your life say about Jesus? Right? What does your life say about our God? For Paul, it was easy. Paul says living means living for Jesus. Right? Living means living for Jesus. Look how he says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He says, My old self has been crucified with Christ, so it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live on this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Man, we should echo those words as Christians. Right? We should say, listen, I no longer live for myself. I live for Jesus. My old self has died on the cross. I live in Jesus. Jesus lives in me. And now that you know you're a citizen of heaven, so while I'm here on earth, in this body, I'm going to trust in Jesus. Because He loves me. He loves me so much that He gave up His own life. My King gave up His own life for me. Amen? All right, so the last point is this. It was a time of re uh, retaliation. It was a time of retaliation. So let me read verse 26 and 31. All right, 26 and 31. And Samson said to the young man who held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. And on the roof there was about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember and please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those who he had killed during his life. Then his brothers and his families came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Estal in the tomb of Mon Monah, his father. He had judged Israel for 20 years. So point A is Samson's desire, right? Samson stands before the people as a shell of a man who he used to be, right? Yet in his darkness, in his imprisonment, he turns his heart towards the Lord, right? He prays to God and he asks for strength so he can avenge the people that took his eyes out. Now you might think his priorities are somewhat out of control here, right? But listen, he's heading in the right direction. Because Samson wants to see the enemies of the Lord be destroyed. I mean, after all, this is why the Lord raised them up from to begin with, right? Now, there are times when we fall into sin. We do, right? And what we do is easy to allow that sin to keep us from seeking the Lord in prayer. 
and seeking the Lord is the only avenue we have for restoration. We must not allow guilt over our actions, depression, or discouragement to keep us away from God. He's the only hope of restoration we have, so we must go to God. We must be honest with God with our sins. And we need to seek His forgiveness. And when we do, listen to me, He always hears us. And He will forgive you of your sins. Is it possible that some of you in this room are harboring unforgiven sin? Everyone around you thinks you're doing well when it comes to your spiritual walk with the Lord. But you know the truth, don't you? You know that you're cold. You're distant. You're empty. You know you're not where you used to be with God. We used to be with him all every day, reading the Bible, never missing church, and prayer constantly. You and Jesus were like this, weren't you? But now you know you have allowed sin, you allow life, you allow things to get between you and the Lord. Listen, your restoration will not come to pass until you get honest with God about your condition in your life. Amen? Listen, the horrors Samson suffered at the hands of the Philistines allowed him to examine his life. Right? He had time to think about what he did. And he took the necessary steps, and God accepted him. His bondage resulted of his freedom. His blindness helped him to see the light of God. And what did God do? God forgave Samson and used them once again. Right? God forgave David for his sins and used them once again. God forgave Peter for denying Jesus three times. And he used Peter in a powerful way. Your sins do not have to define you. That's right. Right? Right? Your fall doesn't have to be the last thing people remember when it comes about your life. Yes. Right? Your sins don't have to have the last word. Amen. But you got to come to Jesus. You got to be honest with him. Seek his forgiveness and he will restore you and use you for his glory. Amen? Amen. So point B, Samson's deed. His deed. So Samson asked the young man that was there holding his hand. He goes, can you help me find the pillars? And then again, the young man does. Right? And when he does, what does Samson do? Samson calls on the Lord and then he pushes with all his strength. And the pillars in the temple came crashing down. Now the temple is filled with Philistines. Right? And they're seeing what Samson's doing. But they, they think it's funny that Samson is praying to his God and trying to push these pillars. You understand, to them, they thought this was a great joke. They see him as a has-been, as a wash-up, as a nobody. To him, they're like, dude, you're just a fool. All you deserve is our laughter and our ridicule. But Samson prayed, right? And then he pushed, and God answered his prayers. And the temple of Dagon came crashing down, killing 3,000 Philistines, including Samson, though. Right? Samson killed more people at his death, more Philistines at his death, than he did when he was alive. The whole point here is that God used Samson once more, one more time. Right? God used Samson to strike down the enemies of God. And he will use you too. But there needs to be repentance, there needs to be forgiveness, and there needs to be restoration, and when there is all three of those things, God will use you again for His glory. Point C, Samson's death. So this mighty judge of Israel, he's gone, he's dead, and his brothers and his family, they come to Gaza, they come look through the, the rubble, and they find his broken, battered body, and they take it home, and they honor him by giving him a proper burial. You understand, in those times, that was very important. But chances are is that your sins won't have the same set of events the way Samson's life was. Chances are is that your sins, when you fall, right, you'll seek the Lord, God will forgive you, and God will make you useful again. Right? Chances are is that you're not going to die by doing the will of God. 
Right? What that means is chances are good that God's going to use you, He's going to bless you, and He's going to bring you home to His glory in a usual manner. And we all, as Christians, we want to hear those good words that we read in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, chapter 25, verse 21, where He says, His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. The sad part of many people in this world won't hear those words from Jesus because they never dealt with their sins. Right? Because they never seeked his forgiveness. They never seeked his restoration. Now there are people in the family of the Lord that will fail God. But many of those will come back to God. Right? Because they will humble themselves. They will confess their sins. And God will restore them. Will forgive them. And when they see the Almighty God before them at the end, they're not going to hear any mention about their sins. No. They're going to hear those good words. Well done, you good and faithful servant. So when we fail, because we will fail in our life time to time against God, we need to seek His forgiveness quickly. And when you do, like He says, I will forgive you and I will restore you back to usefulness. Amen. Because if you don't, then He's going to touch your life with punishment. Not because He wants to destroy you, because He loves you. Just the way He did to Samson. When Samson wanted to be in his sins, when he wanted everything else except God, God just removed His hands and said, Go be. So if you rather choose your sins over God, then God's going to remove His hands from your life. There's a lot of things we can learn from these scriptures. But one thing that keeps coming to mind for me is that sin comes at a high price. Yeah. Right? If you decide to stay in your sins, you know your sins. You decide to stay in your sins, then be prepared for your consequences. Because they're going to come. And it's going to be consequences in your family. It's going to be consequences at your work. And it's going to be in your church and your community, and it's going to come. It's a price that I promise you, just like Samson, you want to pay. So let's don't be like Samson. Right? Let's get honest with God this morning. Right? Every day we should look and pray to God and look at our lives and say, forgive me. Be humble. Right? We're not perfect. Right? Remember, you are a citizen of heaven. You belong to Jesus. If you've given your life to Jesus, look, you belong to Him. But He has plans for you. He wants to use you in mighty ways. Remember, we're here. This is not our home, right? Our home is in heaven. We're just here on, on vacation, temporary in this body. So let's trust in God. Let's trust in the Son of God who gave His life up for you, right? So this morning we're going to worship like always, but I encourage you, look at your life. What does it say about Jesus? Does it scream Jesus? There has no evidence in Jesus in your life, in your home, at work, right? Get honest with God. He knows the truth. I give my life to me. You might lie to your spouse, your friends, and everybody else. You can't lie to God. He knows it. Be humble. He knows you're not perfect. Like he says, all I want you to do is confess your sins. Tell me that you did wrong. And take the rest. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray this back into worship. Heavenly Father God, once again, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, you have given us a great message. A message to end the year, God. I never thought about that. A message to tell us before we go into 2020, God. Let's be honest with you. Let the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, my Lord, let it speak to us. Let it convict us of the things we have, the things that we put in place between us and you. Father, give us the mindset, the heart of to be humble, that we need you. Now, every day we, we need you every single day of our lives. Thank you for the, the story, the life of Samson, God. And I just pray that 
as we continue going into 2020, God, that we would think about you, think about this plan you have for us, God, this plan to use us not for ourselves, not that we want to get rich, God, not that we, that we want to be blessed with bigger things and no sickness, God, but let's, because this is not our home. Father, use us in a way that we can reach out to those people that are lost, those people that don't see Jesus, those people that they, they're in sin and they have no idea. Remember how you used to be, church. We used to be blind to that. We had no idea. We were so off until you gave your life to Jesus. The light turned on and you saw yourself in the mirror and you realized, wow, how was that? What was I thinking? Why did I do those stuff? Yeah, there's people out there that need to hear the name of Jesus. Listen, they need to hear your testimony. Right? They need to hear what God, what Jesus means to you. How God has changed your life. That should be our goal every day, especially going into 2020. Let's have a vision to reach the lost. Because that's what God has called us to do. Is to go out to love Him. Love others. And go and make disciples. I pray this in the mighty name of your Son, my Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.